I'm just very happy uh, to be here, and uh, um, I've uh, here heard uh, many of the wonderful talks. I actually have to confess I have not written a single paper on parallel in time. I did write one, but never somehow never finished. But uh, <laughs> but I have uh, uh, I I was just looking at some of my papers. I was very interested in this topic. When I first heard about this uh, parallel in time, this is my Google kind of scholar. I, I have written uh, quite a few papers on, on two grid method. I don't know if some of you do. Actually, uh, I, then I was looking, when I first heard about the uh, parallel in time, this, this reminds me a paper I wrote uh, just uh, only 22 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, um, this is a, the, the idea I had is what I call a local and parallel finite element algorithm based on two grid discretization. I do a coarse grid uh, discretization, which is global. Then you do a fine grid uh, uh, parallel computation. Does it sound like a parallel? <laughs> so I, I had this paper, uh, when I first heard of it, then oh, if you do the Hilti equation, it seems to be very immediate from what I, I analyzed. And I always wanted to work on it, but somehow you always get distractions. And I'm just uh, had this uh, thanks uh, to, uh, to uh, Lawrence to bring me the attention to this uh, meeting. So I got to know the state of art of these things. And I still want to probably go back uh, if some of you uh, can talk about uh, Especially, oh, uh, Martin, you, you, you said that maybe I could say that uh, if anybody interested uh, in a postdoc, still looking for a postdoc position. And I'm a, oh, this my size. <laughs> uh, I'm actually, uh, I've been in Penn State for 30 some years. Uh, recently, uh, I, this year, I'm moving to Coast, and uh, I stayed there for at least one year. And uh, um, anyway, if, uh, I do want to get into this parallel in time things. Uh, if any of the young people, maybe you can visit or uh, post uh, I would be very happy to, to, uh, to have a, uh, a collaboration on this topic. And uh, Martin uh, <laughs> very kindly wrote to me, OK, uh, you can give a talk, anything. You say anything close to my heart. <laughs> uh, but I've been. <laughs> I've been uh, studying uh, deep learning in the last uh, three years, I think, two or three years on and off. I'm still, uh, I'm still a student of, uh, of the subject. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I will just share some of the, my own understanding of this business from numerical analysis point of view. And it's all math, and um, mostly math. And uh, it certainly is only a, a partial a picture, by no means uh, complete. And, uh, but it offers some, some uh, you know, views from our angles as a mathematician, as a numerical analyst, especially multi grid method. And uh, so. <coughs> So I, do, I have 129 pages. It's the uh, end of the day. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, uh, I have some uh, things I can go fast, but I can also skip some sub subject. So I will give some kind of a generic introduction of what, what I understand, what's the AI. And uh, so then you, uh, I wonder, you know, I have never taken statistic courses, so I, so the, my way of looking at the statistical learning, for example, logistic regression or support vector machine, which is the basis, starting point of deep, deep learning, as a, at least for some applications. And uh, then, I, uh, then I relate, uh, wait, wait a minute, where's, where's my finite element? Uh, did I miss the finite element? <laughs> this slice, okay. Uh, then I, <coughs> I will talk about the. Then I will talk about the. Uh, uh, 
Uh, I, I think I've missed some slides. Well, uh, I probably should go back to get the slides. <laughs> then, uh, uh, then I talk about the convolutional neural network, which is uh, which I viewed as uh, a small variation of multigrid, as we we know. And uh, another thing is that uh, using neural network solving partial differential equations. And uh, um, <coughs> so uh, when we actually, especially when, when in the old days, I think of Martin, we, when we give talks, we would, we're going to advocate computational science. We just, oh, we have a theory, experiment, and the computation. But these days, they have to, we add this is a, a data. And we call it data science. Actually, when I talk uh, to my my colleagues at Penn State, my, like say, data science or deep learning, they actually always ask, is data science really a science? And uh, <laughs> is deep learning really a science? And uh, you know, I've got this, uh, you know, they say, deep learning is alchemy. <laughs> you, you tune your hyperparameters, <laughs> you, do, you try to make it work. <laughs> and uh, now, <laughs> I can only say some mathematical understand. Okay. And, uh, <coughs> so when you say intelligence, I ask myself the silly question: What is intelligence? Huh? And uh, I look it up. <laughs> so Google, you know, you may be ability to learn, understand, make judgment, decisions, and uh, well, this is some part of the intelligence. And uh, we have this brain. We make this. The decision. That's all your natural brain. Then you have the artificial brain, the neural network. It's designed by the human. So artificial intelligence is the machine intelligence. And uh, so it's actually developed by the man. Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to use this very simple example to walk you through to, to derive you some neural network. You want to go deep neural network. And uh, we have to make a decision every day, yes or no. That's a simple decision. Well, it's not so simple in general. But, uh, so we have to make it mathematics. OK, yes or no? Zero, one is yes or no. So you have some threshold. And uh, if you take a job, if the salary is more than a certain number, I'll take a job. <laughs> but uh, you, you have some threshold. That's the decision. It's heaven side. This is activation function. What are they called? Huh? Now, so suppose we're hiring, uh, let's say, a secretary or, or assistant. So I'm going to only hire the person if uh, the person has more than three years old experience, the three ex year experience. That's the, so this, I get the simplest uh, neural network, OK? The input is number of years of experience. Then you, the output is the decision, one or zero, OK? That's the simplest the neural network. And uh, maybe you have experience of other, maybe education, you know? And uh, in this case, uh, you have to have uh, two variables, two, two. And that's input. You put some weight. Now it depends if you think uh, experience is more important than education or the other way around. Now you put your weight on it. OK, I consider, in my opinion, probably education is more Important. It will all be a PhD here, right? <laughs> so, and uh, so you put a weight to two, or then you do some kind of. In this case, uh, you want to hire people, so maybe a PhD. You know, three years experience. But if you sometimes have more experience, like say, yeah, uh, I probably even hire uh, a master degree, or hire a bachelor degree. To, person because he, he has, has more experience or more, more experience, then uh, so you do a weight, uh, you do this kind of a combination of factors. Okay. And uh, so I have another neural network. This is a, a neural input layer, output layer. H is activation function. H is a one variable function. <coughs> so this is H uh, heavy side function has only two values, zero, one. It's discontinuous. In the old days of machine learning, that's how people use these things. But then uh, this, uh, and this one actually is out of favor because it's discontinuous. You cannot even take derivatives. So 
But uh, for other reasons, suppose I want to hire somebody also in the meantime, I also give the salary to the person. In this case, I'm going to use this is the most popular activation function in machine learning. Redo. <laughs> uh, uh, the rectified uh, linear unit. Hinton gave that name, but uh, uh, it's uh, for me. I love it. It's a, it's a finite element. It's piecewise linear functions. Okay, you take the positive part of this input. When x is less than zero, is zero, right? So now I'm going to hire, this is a more refined decision. If my output is greater than zero, I hire the person, but I also give the salary. OK? For example, I do this one here. <laughs> I put the, I still have the weight I had from last time, but I did a different activation function, but I put $2,000, $2, there. maybe it's a dollar, euro. Here's a euro, right? So maybe I get a, you, you, you put the weight like I had before. This time, I give you a salary. And uh, if the salary is zero, I don't think the person will come. That means uh, we're not going to hire him. OK, they, <laughs> they, they, uh, so this is uh, another neural network with, 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 this, uh, with this wonderful activation function. It's called ReLU. And uh, so this is getting a little bit more interesting. In the more refined model, so you have years experience, maybe managing experience, you know, and, uh, you have a degree, maybe a universal rank, and uh, maybe GPA, I don't know, it depends how. So you have all the things. When you have put a CV, you see these things. So now the input is a five. This is called an input layer, five variables. So you may think that, uh, you know, I said that this is experience, experience, uh, all have the year management, but the experience also is may, may not only depend on these two guys. In this case, maybe, maybe your degree also your enhance your experience. One year probably means like two years for the low, you know, the other people, you know. So I put a dotted line here. So you, this is this is the connection. So if you <laughs> education again, uh, you know, we don't have the three three things are directly related, but. So in this case, I get a new variable, x1, which is based on, so you, you do the uh, activation, right? You get this x1. And from the x1, there's a, you have two components, experience and education. I'm going to go back to use my, 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 my model I showed you earlier. In this case, I decide this y. Uh, wait a minute. What is my y? Y is W2, maybe I can decide the salary and all that. So this is based on if the human resource or the boss, based on your experience, okay? And then you have many other experiences. Maybe the, the way the person look, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I, you have lots of things. But I mean, human being uh, makes the decision based on your experience, sometimes based on some kind of intuition or whatever. But now let's how, how, how going to let the machine to make the decision? <coughs> that this is a, a deep neural network already. So in this case, I have a, this have a four layer. This is input layer, output layer. There's all the two hidden layer, what we call it. Every time you apply the activation function once, you got one layer. Okay. And uh, so that is already an interesting neural network. Now the question is that. Uh, uh, so if now if you do deep neural network, if you go to the computer science people's talk, they just plot these things. If it took me several months to understand these things. <laughs> this is what they do. Now you, you can get some idea what this means, right? Huh? You, you, you have some input, this is output. But there I only output uh, one number, salary. And uh, in uh, machine learning, one of the application is uh, classification, for example. You have maybe five class, 10 class, then it will be a vector of five uh, components. So you can, now you, I hope you understand these things. <coughs> so this is just an example, okay. And uh, they actually call the, what the heck, what you call a neuron, you know. You can think about, uh, neuron is basically, uh, uh, a linear function together 
with uh, activation found here. I would call that one a neuron. But actually, if you go to the human brain, I'm going to bring some slides. There's uh, some amazing correspondence. <coughs> Now the question is that now you want to do the machine learning, okay? They want to what is all the AI, all right? Suppose you hire people, okay? Now you somehow put some waste there, right? You use your experience. In this case, I just uh, now. But the when you do the machine learning, the data does the job, okay? Okay. Well, what, what, how do I make it more precise here? Uh, how now the thing is that uh, so so you you have to have some data. Let me you you hired uh, uh, some people. Let's say hundred people. You have to have a sufficient number of data, you know, to have an intelligent system. Suppose you have uh, n equal to hundred. So after a couple of years, uh, you give an evaluation of the people you hired, right? Say bad, fair, good, very good, excellent. Five. This is a classification. Probably have five classes. You label the people you hire. This is called a label. Huh? Ah, I, we, I regret I hired this person. <laughs> so it's zero. Okay. The other person is excellent. So you give him a, a score of four. So I have this model I showed you before, right? And then in this case, uh, 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 sorry. So you have this model. Somehow you, you use your experience to do it. But this time, what I'm going to do is the following. So you use the, the data, this, this weight with the parameter is unknown right now. So you want to fit the things with the, the evaluation, which you got, OK? You hire 100 people, you just fit this. And now you just go backwards. This is the inverse problem. You know? It's data fitting. Machine learning is just data fitting, OK? Uh, but you can think about e square. Actually, there's a, a better way of doing it. It's called logistic regression. But the, but uh, uh, we, you know, usually we can do uh, do do these squares, and uh, so what are you going to do? So uh, you <coughs> you want to do the best fit here, okay? At least to match the the the, the data in the past. Now, of course, uh, this. Uh, when you have a new hire, I'm going to use this, uh, this, uh, this parameter learned from the past experience to hire this new person. It comes to, it's come to the, is this going to be very good? Maybe I'll hire him. So this is uh, what is called a test. Uh, but this, uh, from this process to this process, a uh, lot of things can go wrong. There's a lot of uh, issues in there. I'll come back to that a bit later. So you want the main things here. <laughs> The main thing is that you want to do the uh, find somehow minimize what we call a loss function. This thing is called a loss function. So I think oh no, uh, <coughs> this is uh, it's a little bit too not, too simple for this audience. Okay, you want to uh, you want to uh, to find a, a global minimum of some uh, highly long linear long convex functions. And uh, you can think about all the sophisticated uh, optimization algorithms. But I can tell you, this is the most popular uh, training algorithm in machine learning. <laughs> um, it's great and decent. You can uh, walk down like the hill, which uh, what we call the or line search in the negative uh, direction, negative gradient direction. This uh, step size, eta t, is what we call it steps. Oh, well, it's not quite, but it, it depends on the magnitude of the gradient. But anyway, it's the relative steps about the, the machine learning people call the learning rate. The, the tuning this learning rate, if it's too much, you know it's not good. If it's too little, it's not good. So you have to tune these things. Turning the learning rate is a big deal. <coughs> so, uh, so we have different species of different intelligence and uh, like a uh, you think a bird has any intelligence? <laughs> and the horse, even a human being? Actually, I just saw a movie recently. Uh, I don't know if anybody watched this whole <laughs> I saw this like a, about a month ago. And this uh, horse has a very good relation with this. <laughs> they, they communicate, has some intelligence. <laughs> but, and uh, so they, if you 
you know, statistics, you, if you think about uh, this, uh, this functional class to do the learning, and the, the linear regression, uh, it seems still the most popular. The main thing is that this, you know, being a mathematician, you know, you find you want to, somehow the linear model is also still very most commonly used in practice. And uh, well, of course, you, I'm going to come back to the mathematics for that one a little bit later. Then uh, the linear model, which uh, um, uh, you, can, you can also think about uh, the, the, the usually what they call the logistic regression. And uh, then uh, there's something called a support vector machine uses the kernel method, which is uh, proved to be more accurate than uh, linear models in some applications. And uh, I think these days, uh, deep neural network is, seems to be the taking over, beat all the most of the, the classical learning problems, learning algorithm. So there's an interesting, I, I'm not really a neuroscientist myself. When I start to read the things, it is being said, the development of this neural network it was motivated by the brain, by the human neurons. And you have, a, and this is a kind of one-to-one -one kind of correspondence thing. And I won't be able to do a good job on these things, but it, I, I find it quite amazing. And uh, um, so you, you can actually, uh, I don't know, if I want to do, try to explain this, this real cell, then you, I'll get myself in trouble. And uh, I, but the, the, the message I'm telling you here, there's a kind of uh, correspondence between the mechanism here and the neurons, okay? And uh, to have different layers of brain, that's what the neuroscientist says. And uh, uh, based on the reading of the paper I've read, it has been said that uh, deep neural network was motivated from the neuroscientist. <coughs> uh, so the natural, what am I supposed to The natural brain, okay, when you train people, okay, this is kind of, <laughs> you say, I want to, you know, you, you, you tell your kid, all right, this is a dog, cat. You tell them enough time, next time when you see, so you see, well, ah, in this time it's going to be the output, oh, wait a minute. So you, you kind of tell, tell you the, 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 the you know, uh, some features you, you you will see. But now this is what the human uh, will do. What the machine will do is that you get a, <laughs> you do these things. Now you want to do some, uh, you do some match. You, this is, maybe you say the probability one, this is a probability distribution when you do the labor. And uh, a cat, a dog, and a rabbit. But uh, sometimes I cannot really tell for sure. My neighbor walked from, he's, oh, it's a dog or a cat. <laughs> Uh, maybe I give a 70% chance this is a dog, okay. So you can do the labor. So you, you, you do the labor, it's a distribution probably. And uh, now when you, you, somehow you have enough of this thing, you're gonna f do the data fitting, okay? You fit the things. Then you somehow use some optimization algorithm to get the coefficients. So now I'm testing, I'm using my own. So this time, so if you give my output, it's a probability distribution. If it's 0.7, okay, that's a cat. And uh, maybe the next you get the second weight is the largest. And uh, you kind of, you kind of see like a maximum out. You take the maximum component of the, the things which, uh, huh? So you can, that's how you decide. It's a, now how do you learn these things? All right. And the, uh, when I talk to, to, uh, to my friend, I usually, to my colleague at Penn State, it's my expectation usually is, uh, come on, this is machine learning, it's nonsense, no, no math. Now the question is that, uh, uh, you know, English is not a, my native language, <laughs> but uh, certainly not French. <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but uh, I don't really have you thought about the, when you learn, native language and uh, foreign language, you use different method. Native language is by data. Huh? 
you follow your, what your parents say, your siblings. You don't learn grammar. Just say. And, uh, but you have to practice quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> but if you study, I study English, the first class, you, go, ah, you have to do the pronunciation, you have to learn the grammar. I learn theory. Okay? I have to go theoretical things. I learn the theory of the language. You have the rules. Uh, you don't, actually, if you learn the things, um, the nice thing is about the theory is you can actually start to speak. Okay. Can I pop up and say? <laughs> you, you can actually say it very quickly, right? And, uh, uh, but you cannot say it. Uh, uh, so there's a distinction. If you, for computational science, we use the, you know, solve the, our Stokes equation, Maxwell equation, all the physical law. It's, that's like a physical theory. Huh? And, uh, but I'm asking my friends who question about the validity of the data science. So I actually found that uh, I still speak a better my na native language than my foreign language. I learned the former one by data, <laughs> the other one by theory. And well, of course, you, it's very difficult to draw a distinction. You actually put these two things together. The native language, you will go to school to study. Then uh, when you're the foreign language, you want to study in the class, then you have to somehow go practice. And uh, so y if you think about it, the, uh, if you think about um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the machine learning in general, I use that example as an analogy. If you think about, uh, I, I call it logic, I didn't find a better word, okay? Or maybe theory, or it has some kind of rules, physical principle, laws, okay? So you have theoretical science, computer science. Well, computational science, traditionally at least, are mostly based on physical models. But the other thing is the data. You, for example, experiment, I don't know. Experiment, you just try different things. If it works, you, you get it. Data science, certainly. But now the things that uh, computer science do machine learning, for you do uh, image classification, they just, uh, from data to data. Now the question is that, uh, I can say, why don't you pull, do the data and logic together? If you know something in advance already, you know some rules. You know, if there's a, so you should combine this together. So, uh, so you should put the physical law in your last one. Okay. Uh, this is something called, uh, you know, Professor, you know, George Kanyadakis, for example, he has a group called PIN. Uh, physics informed neural network. So you, when you're, in your last function, you put your PDE in there, look at the, but then you also put some data there. So, you know, if you have data, you use, if, you, if you know the physics, you should use the physics. Data is very blind, you know. You just so somehow you have a two good combination of the two. That makes sense. So this is what they call physics informed the neural network. <coughs> but you can do anything like that. You don't have to be physics, the biology. I don't know. And uh, uh, language, you do all that. You don't have to always just use the data if you have certain. Rules which you apply, you should use it. Uh, that's my uh, uh, quick uh, introduction to what these people call AI. Huh? And you have any question? <laughs> and uh, now the question that if uh, the example I gave you. Uh, for example, uh, it's like a classification problem. There's somebody bad, fair, good, very good, excellent. And uh, if you really think about it, and uh, there are lots of things uh, in practice in life, all classifications. Decision yes or no, <laughs> that's a classification. So if you go to the classification, if you go to, so the, uh, <coughs> anyway, so you use the, you know, machine learning, there are different way of doing machine learning. If you, uh, uh, I, I'm going to, what do we do? Come on. 
That's uh, all kinds of uh, machine learning, but you have the supervised learning is something I'm going to talk about. This unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, this is all very important. And this is a wide open area, but reinforcement learning is very important. Autonomous driving, for example, is a very good example of uh, reinforcement learning. But supervised learning is something I'm going to just explain to you a little bit. So again, we'll come back to this example. How, how can the machine tell the difference okay, of the, between three different species? And uh, here's the deal. Now we have to convert this image into mathematics. Suppose this is 300 million pixel. So that means uh, if you take this, this thing as a 3 million component vector. Uh, so <laughs> you put this in the Euclidean space of 3 million dimension. OK, this is uh, when you do machine learning, they always think uh, high dimensional, di curse of dimensionality. Somehow, the machine learning people, if you think about something the image, and they actually tell you apart, they make a long vector. Convolutional neural network is a little bit different. You think I can, they can treat this as a two-dimensional function, when you, if you think about it, the image. But they actually, especially this transformer these days, the, the, the mo most advanced technology, they, 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 they treat this just as a vector. And uh, <coughs> now you place this point into three million dimension. Now the question is the, mo is, 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 is the moment of faith, huh? And uh, if you are able to tell the difference between these this, this three type of, you know, these this points in three million dimension, you better believe they, they somehow should cluster close to each other. Of course, what are the means? Something close to each other. When you see an image, if I shift this uh, to the right, I, I'm still the same person. <laughs> but, uh, but if you think about Euclidean matrix, this is, can be very big. And you have to somehow have certain distance, a metric. You have to, this is part of the learning. So you put them, so in order to be able to, to make the classification, somehow you should be able to so split. Of course, it's not going to be perfect, but you have so all the bylaws or inaccurate things. So if you do those things, now the question is, all I want to do is that uh, I want to find a function to separate them. OK? So function, I don't know what kind of function is this. So I just a function. Uh, but this is part of the deal. What kind of function? A function of lots of parameters. You want to fit the data. If it's a, if it's a cut, and I call it 1, 0, 0, then another one is 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And uh, now you, you do the, as I said, do the, Data fading using the mean square or logistic you know, um, cross entropy, all these different kind of loss functions. So you do some good uh, optimization, which is a big deal. But uh, if you get uh, a trained model, again, uh, this is what I said earlier. And uh, if it's. Uh, <coughs> So if it's a point 0.7, you can say, oh, it's a cat. But it, this is what I said earlier. Now the question is that, uh, anyway, this is a, uh, now the question is that, uh, how do you put a, uh, what kind of function class you want to put? Now if you go to the Google, say, classification problem, you will see this called something called a binary classification. So you think about the Euclidean space. I said two sets are linearly separable. What are the means? But that means you have two sets, you can put a hyperplane in the middle, in between. On this side is one set, on the other side is other set. Okay. So the middle is a hyperplane. This can be. <coughs> uh, amazingly enough, logistic regression, no, the Linear regression, my, based on my limited understanding of statistics, that's the, you, the function they are using. If you give me some complicated data, they want to do a linear regression. You just want to high, find a hyperplane in the middle. What if, uh, uh, of, of course, you can have, uh, uh, anyway, this side is a positive, this side is negative, you find the hyperplane. Now, this is a, uh, 
Uh, you can have a different definition, actually. For some reason, with the statistic books, uh, they, don't only, they usually talk about binary classification. But I, 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 we should usually when they do the multi-class, they just want to do a binary first, then another binary is kind of every time you do a two. But you can actually do multiple class. Okay, the way to generalize these things, you introduce uh, two linear functions, okay? Two class have two linear functions. This is just a little bit of mathematics here. I, I, f I apologize for those of you who have studied statistics, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I actually gave this talk in the statistical department several times. They seem to, they have never seen this before. <laughs> and uh, I, this is kind of a naive mathematical way of doing this. Thing. But uh, so you, you, you <coughs> so the way you find the two linear functions, such that the first class, my first linear function is maximal. The second class, my second function is linear function is the maximum. Okay, this is, if you take the difference, it's equivalent to the previous one. But this one has the advantage, you can take, a, you can take this like a, to n set, a k set, okay? So if I, I take a three classes, if I take a three classes, and uh, <coughs> A1 means that my first linear function is bigger than all the rest. A2 means my second linear function is bigger than the rest. Now you can take these things uh, to the k, k classes, okay? What is interesting is that you, you can take these things here, but <coughs> this is what, what they call, you basically pick the maximal, if the ice component is maximum, it means this, the, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this point belongs to ice class, okay? That makes sense? But there's something called a soft max. Soft max, you basically take the exponential. Exponential is a monotone function. <laughs> then you divide or the sum it up. This becomes, a, you know, if you look at these things, this is between zero and one. It becomes a probability distribution between zero and one. <coughs> anyway, if you go to the uh, now the question is that uh, I'm going to assume that um, you have some k set because linear separable. Now the question is how do you find those planes? Huh? So this is uh, you know this is some wonderful thing. This is uh, this is what we call a likelihood function. You put all this uh, soft max, all this probability together, you multiply them together. You can actually prove that uh, if uh, if this p theta is greater than a half, then the theta Whatever theta makes the p theta to be great, it's a good, if you statistic called a likelihood, from a maximal likelihood is a key word. Huh? Yeah. This is a one simple example. So uh, in this particular case, this means that you can, you, you, this is between zero and one, by the way, because each pi is between zero and one. And uh, so you want to make this one to be as big as possible. So you want to maximize this function, right? And, uh, but I, I <laughs> the interesting thing is that uh, I still, if you, mark, if you take the maximal, you know, uh, uh, you do the uh, concave function maximal. <laughs> but it turns out this function is actually not concave. But if you take a negative log, if you take a negative log, it then become, uh, you know, this is minimal, this is equivalent, right? But you take the, amazingly, if you take a negative, this one become convex. The convex is a big deal in optimization. <laughs> if it's a non-convex, you have lots of minimal, <laughs> a local minimal. But uh, anyway, this is, a very, this is elementary, okay? This is, a, you know, I, all, most of my friends, you might go, have not uh, started statistics because that's how I spend all this uh, little time. And uh, so you actually uh, usually do, a, the interesting thing is that you, the, one of the most important things is the regularization. Regularization is a big deal in machine learning. But I can use this example to give you these things. And uh, if, you, if you, in this case, you, if you do the log, the, this, this, uh, I added this uh, regularization term. It turns out, uh, if you do not add regularization, even for the linear model, this one has no global minimizer. It, it's like one over x, you know, you go to one over x to go to x to infinity. You go to, and you, ha you don't have the local, so you can't really find it. So if you do the regularization, so you can, you, first of all, it makes it strongly convex, and it has a global minimal. And uh, so if you, 
if you do the if you don't do the lambda equal to zero, uh, if if you don't have the regularization, and uh, then uh, this one may not have a, it has no global minimum for this one. So if lambda is sufficiently small, you have a global minimum. You find the global minimum. You do the you do the job. This is what they call logistic regression. Okay. So you, you, even for the linear model, you need a, a regularization. <coughs> Why do we need the regularization? At least for this one, I have a stronger convex. Uh, you know, you have global minimum over that. But you know, the main thing is about uh, the generalization. Now, if you have two sets here, right? If you have two sets here, you have infinitely different places you can put this uh, hyperplane. In machine learning, there's a keyword called over-parameterization. Huh? So put a billions, I'm not exaggerating, billions of parameters. But the data, how can you get? How, how many data you can get? A few million? So I don't, maybe Google, they can 100 million. Is uh, you have more parameter than data. There's no way, you know, they, you know, we have a problem here. <laughs> so always, well, on the determinant system, you want you to you introduce regularization. But I, uh, now there are lots of global, you, I mean, global minimal means that you can put any hyperplane in between. Now, what's the best place to put? The best place to put, the best place to put is what they call the generalization accuracy will be good. If you, next, next time you give me a data, I want to test, does that belong to A1 or belongs to A2? This certainly is not a good spot. If I have something that's here, it's a little bit to that side, then okay, this plane tells me it belongs to A1, it's not good. So what do you think is the best place? I put it in the middle. <laughs> This is what they call the support vector machine. <laughs> you put it in the middle. <laughs> and uh, uh, I always simplify everything. But I, what I'm saying is true. But, uh, this, uh, uh, <coughs> the interesting thing is that uh, it turns out the logistic regression will approximate SVM when lambda goes to zero. Anyway, somehow I proved the things. I, I believe this must be known by statistician, but I, I cannot find a book which is, that has it. But I can't, there's no way this, this should be new results. But in any case, I'm telling you that if lambda go to zero, if you have a lambda, at least for this one, it helps you in many ways. It also helps you for generalization, better generalization. Does that make sense? <coughs> now, but, uh, but in practice, uh, you cannot just uh, rely on linear to classify things. For example, the cat, the dog, the rabbit, I can tell you they are not linearly classifiable. The accuracy is like a 2% or something. But, but, uh, uh, so it's a, but they're still, so what it, what it does, the, this deep learning, what it does, this is the key. This is the way I look at it. You want to find, the, OK, let's just give this example. If you look at this example, there's no way you can put a hyperplane between these two sets. Okay? So you want to find a, a mapping, which I call a feature extraction. And uh, so that uh, so in this trivial case, I get, a, I get a linear classifiable. So now the question, I give you a bunch of data. So you have to believe they're separable. Oh, come on, you feel so good dog and the cat, the rabbit, you, you know it can be separable. You have, now the question is you have to pick the features that it just does the job. But if you think about these things, huh? and uh, this is not a difficult mathematical, it's not a difficult job, mathematically speaking. And, uh, <coughs> and um, you know, this, the feature can be, can be a, uh, very simple. For example, I don't know if you if classify some old man, young people. I have a lot of wrinkles here, so that's all you need to do. But uh, or you can, you know, you you can only take uh, some features, so which is kind of a very low dimensional. Huh? So I, I I make those features low dimensional. Then I put this make a linear model out of it. Okay. Now the question is that I don't really know what is my linear. Now the question is that you have to figure out what kind of long linear mapping, uh, long linear things you want to do. This is, and uh, and uh, uh, how to find this long linear mapping. 
<coughs> for example, if you have this set, and uh, this is certainly not a linear separable. So you could do this one, or you want to do this one. Mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> so this is all the kind of what we call outliers, you know. But if you know to, if you really want to do what they call a training data, really do a best possible job, you don't want to do that. Because maybe this data is not so reliable and all that. So this is what called overfitting. We actually, you did it too well. You, you, you know, you, you fit the training data too well. You don't want to do that. You want somehow on the average is good. So this one is good. Uh, so this is all, uh, you be, this good reason is that uh, next time if you have a data here, you, don't, you want to put this one belongs to this one, but not the other one. So, uh, so this is what is desirable. So this is where, uh, if, you, if you have the uh, training data, if you really find the global minimum, you, you are doomed, okay? You don't want to find the global minimum. Oh, there's lots of global minimum if the parameters, if there are billions of parameters, only a million data, there's a tons of global minimum. You want to find the global minimum that will, that will generate well. That's the huge deal and in the machine learning. That's the most difficult thing. It turns out uh, something like stochastic gradient descent method magically does the job. There are some theoretical understanding of this, but for, it's still a mystery. I think from <laughs> numerical analysis of you, I, 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 I think we can make some sense out of it. But anyway, I will come back to this later. <coughs> the popular choice of the, you know, another question is that you want to, so there's a God, there's, there's some kind of, this, this is called the decision boundary, you know. <laughs> is there something, something, which is kind of a long linear function. Now, we are numerical analysts, okay? How do you approximate some function? We, we you know, each of you, you solve, uh, you want to approximate your, heat, your, your wave equation, your heat equation, this one. But here, there's some hidden boundary, uh, decision boundary there you have to find, to approximate it. So what are we gonna do? You, you do spectral method first, maybe? <laughs> you want to do polynomial, right? The reason you can do polynomial is that because you, uh, what do you, do? you can do polynomial. The kernel function actually, interesting enough, there's a, uh, this is related to the PDE, that's called a radio basis function. If you, some of you, if you look at the radio basis function, which is a meshless method, and the, the, the background theorem is actually a kernel method. And uh, it turns out, uh, by the kernel, you can give you hiddenly some kind of uh, feature map here. There's a huge literature in statistics. They want to study the kernel, or the approximation property, or that. And uh, like Gaussian, for example. And the deep neural network is, uh, now if I draw you this uh, plot, you know what I mean, okay? The input uh, is, uh, is a variable, then you have the output, it's just some kind of functions. <coughs> The model capacity is that um, approximation. Now basically, suppose my decision boundary function is some kind of a long linear continuous function. Right. It doesn't have to be continuous, but mostly you can think of it as continuous. Now the question is that can you, is your, is your function class rich enough to approximate this guy? We know that uh, polynomial is rich enough because the polynomial can approximate anything. And, uh, uh, <coughs> this is called a Wellstrass theorem. Well, well theorem. And uh, it, I mean, you can choose the uh, coefficient appropriately. You can approximate any continuous function on a compact set. And uh, the kernel, if you have the, the kind of universal kernel approximation thing, you can choose enough this points. And uh, you, there's also approximation theorem of that kind. Uh, especially for those of you who do the radio basis function kind of method, that's the, the question you have to ask, why your method converge? Ha, huh. this is the one that is, uh, if you do this funny looking functions, okay? <laughs> you take a linear function, you take activation, we so far we have seen the heavy side and the real, right? 
I told only one layer. This is an A neurons. Given any function, <coughs> can you find a bunch of A, I, w, I, B, B, I, and, and, and as n approaches infinity, this would approach to F? That's the first question, at least from a mathematician's point of view, I want to know. And uh, what do you think? On the what condition? Let's uh, just relax a little bit. For those of you who know the answer, you'll be quiet. <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> if you don't know the answer, it's fun, I promise you. Martin, have you seen this before? OK, good. <laughs> so you're quiet. <laughs> what, what, uh, what if an omega is a polynomial? Is, is, is it going to do the job? What do you think? The, game of the, the name of the game is that uh, sigma is fixed. We all love polynomials. <coughs> Let's relax a little bit. How many of you think this is good? <laughs> it's okay? Okay. How many of you is not okay? <laughs> Other people are neutral. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. Because if sigma is a polynomial degree five, one variable is fixed. If you do multivariable, if you do composition of a multivariable linear function, it's always degree five with multivariable. If you give me a function as degree six, you cannot approximate it. Now, the, so the polynomial, <coughs> when you do machine learning, most of people, they say the key word in machine learning is long linearity. But this is not quite right, because the polynomial is also long linear. <laughs> For long linear, you cannot, you cannot do the job. Now the question, on the which condition uh, you think uh, uh, this one ha will be a high approximation? If you not have seen this answer before, I I'll give you a moment to think about it. The answer will surprise you. It surprised me greatly. What do you think? <laughs> you you know the answer? No. Okay. Huh? Huh? Maybe it's bounded. It's bounded. Like for example, bound, like a step function. You know, the uh, hyper side is okay. Relu certainly will be okay. They also talk on sigma moyer is okay. <coughs> monotone, monotone? Yeah. That's uh, they call a sigma moyer that the monotone is go to Zero this way, go one that way. This is in early, there's a lot of paper on this thing. <coughs> You're ready for the answer? I promise you, if you have not seen this, I surprise you, but somehow you too much of expectation here. <laughs> as long as it's not a polynomial, it's all okay. Is that it? Do you believe it? This will be an argument in the machine learning. Oh, the choice activation function has to be fancy. But uh, from a mathematical point of view, anything is OK, as long as it's not a polynomial. I spend a lot of time doing approximation theory. I read so many papers on this. But it turns out that I found that I didn't, it's not my result, OK? <laughs> it's hidden in some. I should have put some reference. This is a tutorial thing. <laughs> How about I give you a proof? Uh, I give you a proof, but I, I promise not to be technical, but the proof, uh, uh, I'll, I'll do your proof. Oh, I think this is, give me this. Oh, this one I think, Pinko. This is British. Anyway, there are some papers on this thing. And, uh, uh, but I think the proof, uh, in the Picoso literature, I, I don't know. I. I'm pretty happy with the proof I'm going to present it to you. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, I want to, 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 uh, to make it more precise, but I, I will convince you for sure. You're going to take this. <laughs> this is correct. 
Uh, this is how much I'm going to do the proof for you. So what you do here, you put this, uh, I'm going to put some notation, okay? You put this, uh, this one layer hidden neural network, the sigma or that, you put all this make a collection together. Now the question is that is this one dense? In, uh, in, in C or L2, uh, you know, if it's uh, dense in any one of the things because uh, like the continuous one, if it's continu continuous dense in pretty much everything else, but uh, it, it's okay. Uh, now the question is that, uh, uh, you, let's say, um, I want the interest first of all on which one is actually dense. And uh, if it's dense, what's the convergence rate? I'm going to do the proof. Uh, but this can also be uh, C, okay, it doesn't matter. I'll prove to you, so there's if and only if sigma is not a polynomial. Now, I already convinced you, if sigma is a polynomial, you cannot do the job. Now I'm going to assume sigma is not a polynomial. Then I should always do the job. Now I'm going to assume to you the sigma is a C infinity, infinite differentiable. From C infinity to, to, the, to the other functions, well, I have to be careful about this because it's not a polynomial. It has to be a function somehow. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, it cannot be too great. I think that it should be almost everywhere continuous. Okay, maybe a Riemann integrable or something like that. But uh, you, you will get the idea because uh, this is a good audience uh, to, to, to do these things. <coughs> so, so if this thing is a C infinity, now the question is that uh, if this is all the neural network that I put it together with all kind of neurons, any number of neurons, all different kind of ways. So, uh, <coughs> so this one here, Minus this one, this is just uh, the, the, the one you want to get the derivative, you know. <laughs> this one is the, when h go to zero, is this derivative, all right? But I want to tell you is that uh, if you take a h go to zero, you get this derivative, then I take an omega equal to zero, okay? If you take the limit of some parameter, you still be in the closure, right? Huh? Because the, this guy is already in there, take the limit is in the closure. Now, <coughs> so if you take the chain rule, I get an xj times a sigma prime b. But the question is, sigma is not a polynomial. Sigma is not a polynomial, is you can find the b such that sigma prime is not zero. Okay. Otherwise, sigma is a constant. If this is not zero, you can divide this, uh, this over there, you get a, you get the xj, all this first order polynomial is in the closure. You get it? Now, I want to tell you alpha derivative of any order. <coughs> if you do the chain rule, you get x to the alpha power, you know, this is like a PDE notation, okay? x alpha power. Now, if a sigma is not a polynomial, no matter how many derivatives you take, it's not going to be identical to zero. Something is polynomial, if and only if, uh, if I take enough derivatives, it's going to be identical to zero. <coughs> so I can find some b, which is, uh, this one is not zero. So the x alpha is in there, any alpha. Get all the polynomials. That's all you need, right? <laughs> so that's the end of the proof, except that I haven't done the long smooth case. Long smooth case, the hint is that you take the modifier, you get a, I don't know, when you do the PD, you, do, you can smooth this function. <coughs> then you approximate this modifier by some Riemann integral, which is still going to be in the closure. And then you go from there. So when I first look at this, oh my gosh, this is uh, quite interesting. Uh, how am I doing? <laughs> <coughs> oh, I forgot my water. <sighs> okay, let's talk about the convergence rate. I don't know if you do finite element, we do approximation rate. But doing the approximation of convergence, uh, I thought you, you, you guys may, may like this. How do you get the rate of convergence? And it's a different kind of game to play. <coughs> I'm going to give you actually 
I, I promise not to be technical, but this is elementary. The, the previous proof is elementary, right? But uh, uh, I'm going to use a cosine as, a, as an example. I'm going to take the cosine as an activation function. OK? Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to do the proof here. So the cosine, I'm going to do the Fourier transformation. I, I'm going to assume u is any given uh, real functions. You take the Fourier inversion, you take the real part, it's still the same guy, right? And if you actually write this as, uh, <coughs> as uh, you, you, you pull this, uh, you write this u hat, which is a complex function. You write the module times some angle, e to the i, OK? You put that angle in, into that one, you take the real part equal, equal to that. So this is a linear function, you see? This is a cosine, you see that? This is a linear function with respect to x. Then you have some parameter, but on the integral. So you, you do a, a scaling, this will become a probability distribution because the density function, the integral is equal to 1, right? It's called lambda. So this, is, this becomes the expectation of this, uh, uh, this density function. All right? <coughs> you write this as an expectation. This is G is a cosine of a linear function. But uh, keep in mind that G is a cosine. It's bounded by 1, OK? I'm going to use that later. Now you do sampling argument. This is what they call it. But I don't have to use any probability here. I'm just, uh, 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 you do sampling because uh, if, if you do the probability, if you do this guy here, you do the Monte Carlo method. This is what I call the Monte Carlo method. You do the sampling, or you do the sampling. The, 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 the big deal of the machine learning is that you don't really know the distribution. You can just always sample. In this case, uh, you don't really know you, right? You can always sample. And uh, <coughs> well, maybe you know you, but maybe you don't. And uh, you do the random, there's a lot of things that, uh, if you remind the way my, well, this thing, you, then you do the sampling. This is the difference between the two. And uh, now I'm going to introduce this uh, joint distribution uh, expectation. Namely, you have this uh, lambda. This is a very basic identity in uh, statistics, which I find is uh, quite remarkable, actually. And uh, <coughs> so you have this uh, omega 1 to omega n. You say you can sample independently. Mathematically, it's just independent variables. Independent variable, I mean x, y, z. That's an independent variable, not the probability kind of independent variable. But they happen to be the same name. Then omega 1, omega 2, I put this in the tensor in the product space to dimension <coughs> R, <coughs> RD. Or the uh, times n, and uh, so this is the definition. Okay, this is just definition. This is all still the probability density in the in the product space. <coughs> there's a magic identity. Uh, there's a magic identity in statistics. This will equal to that. <laughs> uh, this two e is supposed to be the same somehow different different font. You do the g square, then I'm going to. Uh, uh, and this, uh, <coughs> this is L2 norm. And uh, this is just an identity. You just compute this. You don't need any probability to do this identity. You just expand it out. So this one is a neg non negative. Uh, neg you drop that one out. But as, as, as I told you, <coughs> the probability, oh, sorry, uh, this one is less equal to 1. So it's less equal to 1 over n. So what does that mean? That means e of g is they exist. Okay, if you have integration of something positive, non-negative function with a probability kind of distribution kind of uh, integration bounded by one, there must be one point is also bounded by that guy. Otherwise, uh, the integration will be bigger. <coughs> so what what I what I get out of it, and. Uh, uh, so they exist. Uh, they uh, sorry. So they exist. Uh, oh, this one. Sorry. <coughs> so for any u, they exist uh, some pro pro coefficient u n, okay, which is in the neural network base. The two norm is bound to the end of the negative half, and the. If you really look at the thing, the, 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 the coefficients are actually bounded by m. 
So this is a, a summary argument. You find an element with the Bramble Hilbert lemma, or the, the, the you know, Poisson, you know, uh, the kernel method, or the, but this one is a sampling argument. <coughs> Again, it's not new, okay? It's just, uh, uh, I just uh, made it uh, sound a little bit more, more or less trivial. trivial. Well, no probability language, but. Uh, so this actually, uh, I'm not doing good with my time. Uh, so how, how much time I have spoken so far? <laughs> you still have time. So. <laughs> okay. And, uh, uh, <coughs> so uh, this is, I'm going to show you something which I, I'm very happy that we have got, which is, uh, uh, so now the way to do is that we're going to record some kind of, we're going to do some math, right? So we're going to have the neural network which is a kind of stable neural network because when I do the sampling arguments, this is bounded by M, you know, it's a one over. So I'm going to, so my omega, omega I, B, I can be anything. And uh, then I, I, I put an M there. <coughs> so it, you can do it in general that consider dictionary. Dictionary that uh, D is, uh, for example, is set to look like this, D in this case is uh, all the sigma w omega dot x plus b. That's uh, all the collection of d, okay. And uh, so this is kind of, we call it kind of one layer neural network. <coughs> now we're gonna com consider approximation probably. But this is uh, things, uh, and uh, I, um, I spend quite a bit of time in this topic. Maybe I, uh, I'd like to share some of the results to you. So, <coughs> Let's go, we call it dictionary. Dictionary in this case, uh, oh, I can even write these things here. This dictionary here, this, uh, this dictionary is a sigma. This is this, 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 this D. It's all this uh, sigma W dot X plus B. This is all this, all this possible set like this. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> it's a dictionary. So, they are, so this uh, can be a, a plus or minus. Let's just put the more plus or minus there. So these are the, all the possible <coughs> things in there. So, uh, so the, the, the intro, important thing is that we'll take the convex hole of this dictionary. Take the convex hole on the, some Hilbert space, let's say L2, okay? Such that the, the, the coefficient is bounded by that. Oh, actually for R equal to one, I beg your pardon. For R B1D is actually the convex hole, sorry. B1D is the closed convex hole of D. This is going to be my, my, my functional space that, I, that I'm going to identify so that my neural network can approximate. For example, in, in, in what we do, okay, H1, H2, H3. Here I call, the, I'm going to call this, uh, uh, the, the kind of analysis we do, this H1, H2, you don't, do, you don't get a good estimate. This is a kind of a replacement of the H1, H2, H3, the sobering space, or W. This is not a sobering space. <coughs> and uh, so we into, with the kind of variation space, we want to introduce this K1D, which is, I borrowed the notation from approximation uh, uh, literature. Such that, uh, you know, you could F is the kind of, uh, <coughs> the, the smallest of the BRD. Uh, the, with radius r, you, if you think about a, a, like a Hilbert space, like 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 like, like, a, like, a, like a Sobolev space, you can think about the Sobolev space. Uh, if you, you already know the norm, you know the radius about bounded r. In this case, I know the radius. I use that to define the so the, 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 the the space, the, the norm of that guy. Anyway, it's a little bit of technical, but uh, uh, you can actually prove that this variation space uh, is a Banach space. <coughs> Uh, why I'm interested in these things? The, I have the sampling argument I showed you for the cosine. Now the question is how general that argument can go. I believe we have identified the right space again, is the most general. So the way to go is the following. So if I, if I do this, uh, now I'm asking myself a question. If you do the sampling argument, you know the sigma AI is bounded by some M. The M is actually the, the norm you are looking for. But anyway, uh, the question is that what kind of F so that uh, you know this one can approximate? What kind of F? What kind of functional class? 
and uh, <coughs> to get some rate, to get some norm convergence. This, the, the, the argument I made you before is the qualitative convergence. You, know? you say, I know it's convergence, but I don't have any rate. But this time, I want to have norm convergence. And uh, so it turns out that you, this one is if and only if, as long as my function is in my K1D. And then, uh, then you can approximate. But the most interesting thing is that uh, as long as it's in K1D, you can always get into the, into the negative half. <coughs> so uh, this actually means that uh, we have identified uh, the right functional class uh, that uh, um, that is your, new, your neural network will approximate you and also give you a rate. And uh, actually, we, we have done this for, um, for the reload of the case part. We actually did some uh, quite a number of results recently. And uh, if you do the reload of the case part, you can actually get the into the, you can do better than into the negative half. Uh, so one of the things that I want to show you that uh, I, I know is, uh, <coughs> you know, you, there's a lot of literature about these things. I'm going to relate some this to finite element to you. If you do the finite element method, here's the deal. Uh, <coughs> if I take the ReLU, let me see what was in my next page. If I do the, yeah, here's the, here's the question here. If I take you, if sigma k equal to one is piecewise linear, piecewise linear composed with a linear function is a multi-dimensional piecewise linear function. That's a finite element. Can you visualize that? <coughs> if uh, this is a linear function, right? Sigma, suppose k equal to one is a linear, piecewise linear function. Is a, is a, is a piecewise linear function of multi-dimension. Uh, if you want to subdivide the, the subdomain into a simplex, you get a piecewise linear finite element. There's something remarkable going on here. Suppose uh, when you say, the degree of freedom or the number of parameters for a finite element space, you count the number of elements, right? That's called n. <coughs> now, for neural network, I also have this n, but a different n. But still, if you think the number of parameter is what it matters, if that's the metric you are using, then the neural network is so much better with d times better than finite element. d power, if you think about d equal to 3, in 3d, if the uh, piecewise linear, you get a h square, right? Whatever. In 3d, here you get h to the 6 power. Super convergence. <coughs> uh, Anyway, I want to repeat, the, for example, the neural network, this is uh, this here. That's the one shallow neural network. When you do the deep neural network, you get, uh, let me just repeat this again. You, you do the linear function, maybe, then you do the activation, then you do the linear again, then you get the activation again. This is the more you do, you get more layer, you get the deeper you get. Uh, now the question is that uh, if you, the DN is just linear, wait a minute, why am I doing this again? One of the conclusions I want to, to make is that before I wrap up soon, uh, maybe uh, if you plot the things, you do this linear activation, linear activation, one of the things where I hopefully it's easy to convince yourself, if you take a two piecewise linear function and do a composition together, it's still piecewise linear. The boundary is still poly polyhedral. So now, if I subdivide the polyhedron into simplices, you get a finite element. 
Linje van een moment. Aha. Relu DNA is the most popular deep neural network. As a function class, it's what we have been doing for ages. Okay. <laughs> it's a finite element. <coughs> Actually, uh, uh, this is what we, we all know. So now, this finite element. So, so the question here is that uh, Relu DNA is a finite element. Now, the another question is that if it's a fin any finite element, can that be also written as a DNA? <coughs> Final element began with a mesh, some vertices, some partition. And uh, then you get uh, some uh, piecewise linear functions. Some people don't like a mesh, like the, like, uh, like the point, like a uh, uh, radio basis function stuff. It's called a meshless method. But, uh, <coughs> When you do a deep neural network, you don't have any mesh to begin with. It's certainly meshless. You don't even have any points. I call it pointless mesh. <laughs> There's no point. <laughs> and, uh, but they are the same. As a functional class, they are the same. You can actually prove. If you're interested, I actually have some slides. Uh, in between, it's probably five or 10 minutes to prove these things. And uh, uh, that's my first project that I gave it to my, to my, my group. Look, this is a linear function. OK, well, how is it related to finite element? One direction is obvious. The other direction can be very technical, but you, you don't get the optimal result. There's a simple proof we found. But anyway, <coughs> but the thing is that, uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, why am I keep repeating myself? <laughs> Why they, uh, sorry, what happened? Okay, <laughs> same function class. The most popular deep neural network, which is called ReLU DNA, is identical to the same as piecewise linear function, which we have been working for ages. But remarkably, Incredibly, I cannot <laughs> exaggerate in this enough. <laughs> the rate of convergence, if you really treat the number of parameters in the space or the set, find another element, uh, <coughs> find another element um, is. Um, Number of elements to begin with, you you get the um, uh, you get the the, the, the uh, linear space with uh, n dimension. Let's say here you have n parameter, but there's not a space. If you add the two activation function, two linear spaces with the two neural networks, n neurons, if you add them together, they become two n neurons. So you, you know it's not linear. <coughs> but nevertheless, if you really just say, what's the best approximation rate I can get in terms of the number of parameters? I, I mentioned to you earlier, if for smooth enough functions, <coughs> it's a d power better than finite element. If the, if the higher the d, huh? but of course, there's a lot of story behind it. What's the con constant? What would the other stuff? And uh, what regularity do we need? But, uh, Let's say you take a Gaussian, you take some kind of smooth functions. But it's still very interesting. Okay, there are big claims in the literature. Wow, deep learning has no curse of dimensionality. To see results like this, uh, it certainly give you some hint. Oh, wow, this may be supporting that state. But there's a lot of, uh, I think it's a promising, but uh, there's still, I think the problem is true, but anyway, they, it's very interesting, and uh, but at least from here you can see the potential of it. <coughs> and uh, uh, so that's uh, 
size the, the, the things are, is a half, how many fives? I've I, I taken like half of, half, half of this. And I'm going to summarize here is that uh, so far I have done the, using this decision making, hiring people as an example, you, you naturally see some, some uh, uh, neural network out of it. You also can see this uh, height, this uh, heavy side is the, in the old days, that's the activation function people use. Relu is a neuro, is first new, used by the neuroscientists. That's what they said. And uh, you can see naturally has some kind of mathematical orders of charts to have the deep neural network. Then as a function said, the Relu neural network, I have not proved it, but if, again, if you're interested, I, I can show you a proof. That, um, as a function said, they are the same function class for the old, our very old dear friend, piecewise linear functions, <laughs> but uh, in terms of approximation property, it's not necessarily a fair comparison because uh, the structure can be very different. The other one is a sparse, maybe this one is very dense, but uh, nevertheless, if you uh, think about uh, a set with n variables, the way to approximate for smooth enough function the neural network has the same function class but different structure, give you a much, much better rate of convergence. And uh, um, this result is, uh, we proved it, and uh, uh, it's, uh, the proof is by no means, uh, that's not easy, <laughs> it's uh, lots of technical stuff. So you might also, maybe the proof, my proof was wrong, but uh, <laughs> I still don't quite believe it. But, uh, Anyway, it's online, it's a funny mistake. I, I think it's okay. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> okay, I, now the, the thing is that we, I don't know how much time you're giving me. I want to just outline a little bit. So I said that, that the most popular <coughs> deep neural network which is Relu DNA is identical the same to our old friend, piecewise linear finite element method. Uh, that's the first message. <laughs> My second message is that the most popular, at, until at least two years ago, these days you have all this uh, transformer, all this stuff, and uh, some of them, uh, even for the image classification, still the CNA is still dominating. Convolutional neural network, which is for image classification, the example I showed you earlier. This one, I recently, I call something called MGNet. I was able to design a, a neural network based on a multigrid. And uh, then you give, uh, let me show you. Uh, uh, <coughs> but anyway, I, I don't have uh, much time. Right? But I want to show you the, uh, I want to show you the, if you do, everybody here you know multigrid. This is like a multigrid algorithm, right? This is like a slice cycle. If you uh, do this, this. and uh, the, 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 the way uh, I want to do here is uh, I want to, pro so forgive me, I just watch this very quickly. That if you do a five point stencil, if uh, there's something called a convolution, and uh, if you do the five point stencil, this A will be kernel like that. This is what they call a convolution, okay? It's a discrete convolution for good reason, but uh, and uh, you write the Poisson equation. Uh, like the convolution things. What I actually do, have these things here. If you do a multigrid, right? This you do a multigrid. With, this is my convolution kind of a notation of a, a geometric multigrid. There's no AMG here. It's a, it because the, the reason is that it's the following. Because the reason is the following. Uh, where's the where's my image? Okay, here's the image here. The reason is that uh, the reason. I think I have, oh my gosh, I don't have it. Okay, the reason is that if you give an image, it's a, it's a two-dimensional function on very uniform grid. Huh? Pixel, unit square. <laughs> so we don't have to do a you do geometric multigrid. <laughs> okay. I, I'm a, for some of those of you, I've been working on multigrid for like 40 years. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, so the way to do it is that uh, 
<coughs> you, 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 you solve this, uh, you just, uh, this is my C CNN. This red one is the activation function. It's my feature extraction. And uh, this is how I teach, uh, I've been teaching uh, deep learning uh, like three times by now to undergraduates, graduate students. I ask the student to, to write a geometric multigram method for 2D Poisson. Then I ask them to put this thing in there. <laughs> then you have to train them. And uh, I, so I have a, a CNN which is identical to multigram method in structures. Well, you know what the sigma does, ReLU? What the ReLU does? When you actually do, it's like, I don't know, when you do a, if you do a reaction diffusion equation, I don't know if people do it, I saw people do that. If it's a, the function is a density, for example, or con concentration, you know that that guy has to be non-negative. When you do your computation, what do you do when you say a negative number? Huh? You do a ReLU. <laughs> you do a ReLU. <coughs> And if it's, if it's a negative point of zero, 0,1, you become a zero. If it's a positive, it keeps the original. That's exactly the rule. So if you, if you do my multigrid for solve my, my equation, if I say a negative pixel number, I don't like it. The pixel cannot be negative. I just make it zero. And that's the rule is what, what it does. And they, anyway, the message here is that uh, multigrid with a very small uh, chain. If you look at the things here, you have something called a pooling, you know, you know, if you ever play with it. Pooling is of a restriction. You have a fine grid, a cross grid. It's actually a slash cycle in the CNA. But you, uh, unit, yesterday I saw a unit or the day before. If you do unit, that's our V cycle, okay? <laughs> Somehow they like a U, we like a V. <laughs> you go down, you go up. <coughs> And uh, I actually got a, this is excited about this. I actually thought, oh my gosh, I find something which I know where. So you are find the element, uh, reload the end, you just find the element. The other most uh, f successful network you see, and it's just multi grid. And uh, so, but I know a lot of mathematics on multi grid. Maybe I can do better. <laughs> this is one of the reasons I'm going to cost. <laughs> they, they have lots of CPU, GPU. It is uh, so annoying. If you want to train a CNN for like an image net, I have as a poor mathematician like me, I, I just spent $100,000 buy eight GPU. Eight GPU, if you do parallelization, probably get a four. You needed around three weeks to get a, a number. What if I made a mistake? You know, like you're wrong. Not in three weeks. So there's a lot of things. To do. This training algorithms are notoriously slow, and uh, they spend a lot of money training these things. The transformer, for example, I said uh, the first transformer they trained in Google. They spent three point three hundred three hundred seventy million dollars to train the first transformer. <laughs> And uh, for, that's for power consumption. It's have the uh, electricity to use. They just use a gradient descent. And uh, I think for faster solver people like us, there's lots of work we can do there. But uh, before you do that, you have to. I actually, I, I, I'm interested in this business because I, I suppose I can do better than your gradient descent. Gradient descent, if you do the linear algebra, is Jacob, no, it's Richard's interest for the linear problem. You can do better. But then I realized, well, I don't know even what equation we're trying to solve. That's why I got into CNN and all this stuff. So we have to know what equation to solve. Then you have the highly long linear, highly long convex problems. Then you do the DNC, you know, the, the gradient descent to do that. But anyway, but, but it takes forever to get a, a number. So I, I got my MGNA to my student for the first year and a half. The result is just not good. 
And uh, then I changed the student. I cannot convince them to continue because I have to wait three weeks. <laughs> so I changed the four or five students. I finally got, I'm not going to tune these things. I, I beat all this existing neural network, but only by a little bit. Now the question, why can't you beat more than that? I think the student just finished the job. I beat it. Now you have to have faith, I guess. Can you tune the parameter? But the, uh, that's kind of I can, you, you have to tune a lot of stuff. Uh, now the question, uh, my dream is that maybe we don't have to tune that much. At least the MGNet, the, the hyperparameter, what they call. I have very few hyperparameter MGNet. <coughs> if you go to the CNN, you go to all the things, sometimes the size is one, two, three, five, seven, they all this. You just have no idea whether people get the idea, but it's there. And uh, here I don't, I only, I do multi grid. I, I, I do very few hyperparameters. But even the parameter to get there, I can for the, the you know, there's some kind of MNIST, uh, self 10 self 10 uh, MNIST is very easy. Uh, self 10 is relatively easy. self 100 is a little bit more difficult. And uh, the image generator, of course, but then, of course, then, uh, then you have to do all the data augmentation, all those things, you can get all the high. But I just suppose I play the same rule. I don't do the augmentation. We do, we, we take the one from the network, just based on what the kind of data they had, we, we, we can, you know, at least I can say it's very competitive, but, but at least I have very structured neural network. So that's my second message. <laughs> and this is a multi grid crowd, right? And parallel time is a multi grid algorithm, which I use the two grid methods of multi grid. <coughs> Convolution in your network, at least uh, you can understood, I derived from the classical multi grid we do. And uh, that's a geometric multi grid. There's something called a graph network. <coughs> we have a lot of AMG here. Graph network is just AMG. <laughs> okay. Graph network to AMG. But uh, CNN is a is a <coughs> is a multi grid. Uh, of course, you have all this. Uh, you know, one thing I wonder. Uh, this, this is all revolution. Historic is very important. You know, this uh, young Cohn, they did this uh, M yeast, and uh, <coughs> <coughs> Alex Hinton. This are all uh, legendary figure in this business. And uh, we actually proved that this, another one is called a resonate, it's very important, Kai Ming He. Now, now he's in Facebook and <coughs> used to be in Microsoft. Uh, anyway, we actually can prove our MGNet can be related to resonate in a very direct way. But anyway, uh, but, uh, <coughs> for example, I, you know, I, I just uh, I bought myself a Tesla because I'm working on these things. You have the autonomous driver. If the autonomous driver to make it oversimplify the technology behind it, it's a classification problem. Uh, Tesla has eight cameras. You take eight cameras. The eight images come in. You have to divide this uh, image into five larger classes. <coughs> you drive, you go stay, you know, you, you just drive like, don't change it, that's the first class. You, see, you accelerate, you slow down, you left, right. There's only five classes, okay, roughly speaking. Now the question is become very simple. I give you eight image, you just tell me which class it goes. Then you tell me how to do the driving. That's really the main idea behind it. <coughs> and uh, but of course the, uh, now this uh, I can tell you that uh, the Tesla I'm driving. I'm not a spokesman for Tesla, but I, but uh, when I drive the Tesla, I trust the machine more than than myself because I get a dose of absent mind think about a proof of theorem or something. <laughs> but, but this guy just go, especially the highway. And uh, it works very well. Uh, <coughs> uh, I don't know, this alpha fold, I don't know if you've seen the alpha go. The, the most recent one, I don't know if it's uh, the Lambda of Google. Have you read the story? Oh, you got to check it out. That's scary. <laughs> the Lambda, this language uh, in the Google. 
I think the, this machine is uh, do better than, uh, than me. I, I, the way to answer questions is unbelievable. And uh, the natural language process. And uh, I think the main thing I give to this audience uh, is uh, you want to do the uh, uh, computing. And uh, <coughs> there's a tremendous, it's explosively active research field right now, especially in the engineering community. You want to do the neural network with machine learning to solve PDEs. Okay. <coughs> So I actually spent quite a bit of time to study the mathematics behind it, how, why this thing work or not. Uh, because I'm running out of time, to, uh, <laughs> oh, you're, there, you're going to shut me down in two minutes. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but the, 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 the makes the long story short is that, um, and uh, uh, my current message about um, using your network to solve partial differential equation is pessimistic. And you can get some accuracy, but you cannot get good accuracy. And uh, this is the uh, inclusion. Optimization is always the bottleneck. The gradient descent method is not good for PDE. PDE, we need accuracy. For classification, you don't need much accuracy. They don't even like a single uh, precision. They all take half precision. You know, the machine learning, you know, if you do this half precision, the bar is very low. Or if you have many, many clouds, that's a different story. But uh, so possibly, just amazingly, you can get some number. I, can, I recently actually proved that. <laughs> you do great in this method, you get something which looks like physics uh, very quickly, rather quickly. You still need a few hundred thousand iterations, but uh, the cost is not a concern these days. But if you want to increase the accuracy by 10 more percent, you're not going to get there. I actually recently proved this, you won't get there. So the story is that, ah, if you do a, no matter whatever application you have, you do a least square, or take the residual, you do a training, you do a sample, you do gradient this, you always see something which just looks like a physics. And this has to do with what they call a frequency principle. So, <coughs> so we have proved the partial numerical, you can get a low frequency rather quickly. multi -grading. If you do PDE, you get a high frequency quickly. High frequency won't tell you the profile of your solution. It's the low frequency you, you make the eye, your eyeball norm to see it. So for engine application people, when they say, wow, this looks very look like physics, they get a low frequency. It turns out your network get your low frequency rather fast. But if you want to get the high frequency, which is where the accuracy come from, I have recently proved the theorem is impossible to get there. It takes a million years to get there. But I don't know, they, uh, uh, at least for some problems. That's a, now the question is that you have to do a sophisticated training algorithm. And uh, the optimization algorithm is, uh, is, the, uh, is the bottleneck. Well, we, we actually figure out a, a special class of optimization algorithm, we call it a greedy algorithm. Greedy algorithm, for those of you who do reduced order, ROM, reduced order method, POD, POD, or stuff like that, this greedy algorithm. But the greedy algorithm, we also manage to do the machine learning. And if you have a problem with special structure, you can see that some topic. You can get that correct. It's a hugely important, extremely active field. I have never seen, I've been in this business for 40 years as a mathematician. I've never seen crazy people like so crazy these days, but I'm sorry. And uh, uh, especially the practitioners, all my engineering friends, colleagues, they're all doing these things. And uh, I, I think uh, that's probably true because I, I don't know that many people, but all these people are doing this. <laughs> and, uh, but you, uh, I have a mathematical theorem to show, actually you will always get something reasonable. But the bad news is that if you get a, if you, want to see, if you want to see high accuracy, you never get there. Now we need a better optimization algorithm. I think that maybe this crowd of mathematicians, I hope we can actually uh, make some contribution of it. And, uh, oh, I already passed two minutes, I'm sorry. I, I, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>